They're going to be sharing uh, their story about how they got involved and what inspired them to be the change. And, and that's the whole campaign that we've been running, and that's why we've asked them um, to, to come and speak. Um, both of these counselors have been strong supporters of, of us since the very beginning. Um, both counselors are very good friends of mine. Um, Kristen Wong Tam uh, has a counselor, Kristen Wong Tam, has a uh, a very deep background in her community, um, and, and she'll tell you more about it, but she has a deep background in her community in advocacy, in um, pushing for human rights, um, uh, youth involvement. I, I remember I, I was helping on her campaign, the very initial stages of her campaign before it even um, got into the summer. And um, one of the biggest things that she had said is that I want youth involved in my campaign, and I want them involved, and and um, and, and I want them to be mentored by those who are um, uh, the, I guess the uh, um, the professionals or the the experts in in those various areas. And so I learned a lot from her and from her campaign. And uh, we have Councilor Kristen Walk down. Thank you. Uh, Toronto Rosedale. Toronto Centre Rosedale. Rosedale. Uh, thank you very much, Tyler. And he actually just nailed it right on the head. When I began my campaign, I said I really wanted to make sure that youth were involved, but not just be to do work, like you know that handing out of flyers and knocking on the doors. I wanted you to really learn about the campaign and the machinery about the campaign. And uh, so it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But before I launch into how I got elected, let me just sort of take you back many, 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 many years to how I got to Canada. Because uh, part of the, uh, the experience is really a, a Canadian story, I think, in many ways. Um, born in 1971, no jokes, okay? Um, <laughs> okay, so born in 1971, I came to Canada in 1975. So English was not my first language, but obviously I was young enough to be able to learn it pretty quickly and lost my accent fairly quickly as well. It was not always an easy transition, as many people who have probably um, either you're born overseas or perhaps your parents are, are fairly new immigrants to the country, is that there's always a time for transition. And that transition period for, for myself and my family was, was rather challenging because mom and dad were working class and they didn't have a, a formal education. My dad has a grade four education, my mother has a grade six education, uh, but they also end up being some of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, they're very kind, and they've always said to us, make sure you do the right thing and uh, find the third way. And so with those type of Buddhist teachings, they set off and, and had three kids, and all three of us have, uh, have always tried to do the right thing. And I think in many ways they actually tried to, to instill in us this, this value that you had to always give back to community. Didn't matter what you were and, and how much money you had, if you could help someone, then do so. And so, you know, there's a Chinese proverb that speaks to, you know, the, the, the strength of a tree. And so the bigger the wind and the bigger the breeze and sometimes the strong gusts of gale, you know, if your roots are not deep and if your roots are not strong and spread out, you know, a, a small gust of wind can take you down. But if you have deep roots and you know where you come from, then there's a very good chance that you'll withstand even the fiercest storm ever. So with that very simple teaching, it actually led me to a place in my life where I decided that I wanted to always give back to community. And we were able to do so in, in, in experiences big and small. There's no right or wrong answer of doing anything. That we know for sure, right? Because you and your siblings probably sometimes have a fight over you know, how you're going to be able to set something up or what is the proper solution to a particular problem. But the reality is there's many different ways of doing it. So that journey actually took me to a place where I started to work with other people. And my dad has always said, no one has a monopoly. Nobody owns all the good ideas. There is no such thing as that. So you gotta get the good ideas where you can and you make sure you are listening. Because if you're not listening, you're probably not gonna be able to, to hear but I find that you don't just hear with your ears, but you also have to sort of open your heart and you hear with your heart. Because then when you hear from your heart, you usually take those lessons and you don't forget them. So my political journey literally began in 2010. So prior to that, I had very little interest in organized politics. 
I was a, an activist and an advocate. So I would care about issues around poverty. I care about issues around housing. I certainly was um, viewed as an anti-racist activist, and I wanted to make sure that youth had a voice. But I never would have seen myself in this sort of organized real estate fashion. Um, but that all changed in 2010 with the encouragement with some friends, 40 of them to be uh, exact, I think. And, uh, and Tyler was there at my launch uh, surprise party. But my friends had basically drafted me into running and they really encouraged me to do it. <coughs> because they said, Kristen, you're always full of ideas and you like to complain. Right? <laughs> but every time you, you complain, you always have a solution, maybe one or two or three or four. So the best way of actually making that change, you can do it from the outside, or you can be even more effective by getting on the inside. So they said that they were going to help me get elected, and I said to them, I, it would only work if we did it together. I said, don't you dare put me into political elected office and then leave me alone. And uh, I wanted to make sure that as soon as I got elected, that we threw the doors open as wide as possible so you can come in with me, right? Because if you left me there, after get, putting me there, it'd be a, it would be an incomplete journey. So, so the election campaign was, was such that it was probably one of the most challenging things I've ever done in my life. And I think that if anyone who would like to run for office, think twice, think three times, it will probably be one of the most rewarding things you ever do but it's also going to be one of the most challenging things you'll do. You'll be able to rise to the occasion, I have no doubt, but you're going to have to want to win. And you're going to have to want to know why are you doing it. I've got some friends who are lawyers. They work on Bay Street. They deal with mergers and acquisitions. And they've always said there's three types of people that run for office. And they are egotistical. You want to see your name on the lawn sign. <laughs> and I said, well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I like it. I like it. <laughs> you want to see your name on the lawn sign. Hey, okay, lawn sign. Now, it just so happened I spent 16 years as a real estate broker, real estate manager. <laughs> you had lots of lawns. And, and a mortgage broker. Damn. So if I want to see my name on a lawn sign, I've already seen my name on a lawn sign. So that, that couldn't have been me. Um, so that, that was one thing said. They said a second person that would run for office is someone who's delusional. You really don't know what you're doing, but you kind of want to do it. And you really don't know where you're going, but you just want to do it. Doesn't matter what anybody says, what your chances are, you just want to do it. So that's what my Bay Street friends are saying. So they're saying, you're not delusional, because you seem to know where you're going. The third type of person, in their opinion, that runs for office are the altruistic. The ones like Councillor Carol and I are probably very altruistic. We want to do the right thing. We want to make a positive change. And if I didn't think I could do the job better than the next guy, I probably wouldn't have run. Right? If I didn't think I had something to give back, there's no way I would have done it. Because what life was kind of good. I, I was sort of settled in my career. And it was a big upheaval to change. So you have to go through your own personal evaluation of why you want to do it. And you don't just launch into it for the sake of launching into it. Because it's a, it is really a journey. And I would say, where you go in this journey, it really is reflective of your process. So what the end results will look like, what the end product will look like, will be determined by how you get there, the things that you say, and the path that you lay out before you. Because it's always going to be reflected in the process. So if you're already engaged in student politics, that's great. If you're contributing to your church or your place of worship, that's also really wonderful. If there's other ways of making impact, right? So you'll find you'll find it. It doesn't matter if the gestures are big and small. It doesn't matter whether or not you get press for you know raising a hundred thousand dollars for a particular cause that you care about, or if it's just something as simple as being a part of the intergenerational club from your high school or or your um, or your community center. How you give back is up to you, but it also means that you have to find that task rewarding. Don't do it because you think you're going to have political gains. I don't think you will be happy in the long run. Do it because it's going to give you pleasure. It's going to fulfill you. It's going to make you happy. And that's one I, I personally think. It's, it's so important to do it because you want to do it and you're going to feel good about it. If you put too much into thinking how it's going to be perceived, 
um, you're overthinking it. You have to have a lot of fun. That I know for sure. And there are long, long days. We, we work 17-hour days. And sometimes there's not a lot of fun. But you fill yourself and surround yourself with great people, and you have that synergy. Um, my campaign team was very young. But it was also very diverse. I was able to put it together uh, with the help of friends. And those who said that they were definitely going to be there from the beginning to the end, don't hold them to it. There's a very good chance if it's an eight-month journey, eight-month campaign, or a ten-month journey, it's going to be a very long political process. And especially if you don't have name recognition. Like hard work really makes that difference of putting your name out there. But you also have to reward your campaign team. It has to be engaging and worthwhile for them. So how would you do that? How would you build a campaign team in, in five years when you're ready to run, or 10 years if you're ready to run? If, if it's you and your buddies, and you think you, they're going to be there for you, right? So one of the things that, that made sense to me was, who shares my values? Who cared about the same issues that I cared about and whether or not they were willing to help me a certain part of the way? They may not have been able to carry me across the finish line because it, it was a very long commitment. My campaign was eight months long. That meant for eight months, I took time off from work. I was living off my savings while I ran for office. I was very grateful that I had savings, which not every candidate would have. I was also very grateful that I had a business partner who carried me to the, across the finish line. So it's a huge financial commitment as well. So that's why you gotta plan ahead. And I never wanna see good people run unless they're ready to run because it takes a lot out of you. So the campaign team that I put together was really a bunch of friends and they came from all over the place and everybody had a particular idea of how a campaign should run. And if you can imagine how many chefs could be in one kitchen and all they needed to do was cook one dish, you can give the same ingredients to all 10 of those chefs, and you tell them to make you a particular dish, the one dish. You give them all the same ingredients, all the same utensils, all the same equipment that they, they need to cook that dish, you get 10 different dishes coming out, it's the same dish. So we had to find a way for all of us to build on the strengths that each individual person had and match it with their interests. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, everyone's a volunteer. And if anyone's ever worked in groups where you're actually working with other volunteers, some people do a little bit more lifting. A little bit, I see the faces smiling, right? Some people do a little bit more lifting, some people don't. Some people may start off really strong, but then they sort of, you know, wane back and they, they start to take a breather. But you have to be prepared for those particular surprises. And you can't do it all. You cannot be the candidate, the campaign manager, the volunteer coordinator, the canvas coordinator, the policy uh, uh, writer, uh, you, and you cannot do it all. Your job is to be the candidate and the candidate only. So therefore, if you're even running for, city, uh, for municipal politics or if you're running for student politics, you have to make sure you have the right people around you and that they know clearly what their role is. Has it been a rewarding experience since I got elected? I can tell you that it was a big journey. 15 candidates vying for one little seat. 15 people. The residents of Ward 27, Toronto Centre, Rosedale, didn't know who the heck we were, right? Because they just didn't. Right? We had, none of us had any name recognition, recognition, except for maybe one person. And, uh, and her name was Enza Anderson. She was uh, a supermodel, is her, her moniker. And she had run for mayor at one point. Enza Supermodel Anderson. So Enza had run for mayor, so she had a little bit of name recognition. But the rest of us, you didn't know us. It wasn't like Rob Ford, who had been a mayor for, you know, sort of the councillor for 10 years, who then stepped into the mayoral race. He had some brand recognition. We did it. So as residents in War 27, you never were able to have an uninterrupted dinner during that election campaign. Because every time you sat down with your family, or you sat down in front of the TV to have some supper, there was another candidate knocking on your door. And there were probably about six of us that were really actively campaigning, and they were very good candidates too. But we get to the door, 
and you've got 20 seconds or so to make impact. Now, I don't know how I'm going to get to know you in 20 seconds. Business <laughs> business so having good literature is very important. Um, but certainly in 20 seconds or so, whoever has opened the door, if they were going to open the door, you needed to make some impression. Right? Now, they didn't know who we were, and there were many of us. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of house, uh, household doors to knock on. And War 27 officially has about 100,000 people. It's also the second most populated ward in the city. I've got 13 distinct neighborhoods from one of the richest, most established uh, households, uh, sorry, neighborhoods in Canada, Rosedale, to one of the third poorest neighborhoods across our nation, and that's the Garden District Moss Park area. Like, the income polarization in our neighborhoods were so vast. It was incredible. Some of the, the mansions I would walk into were like 13 rooms and, and seven bathrooms. I, I, I didn't know who lived there. And then some other places I knocked, in, knocked on those doors and there were social housing. People would come to the door and they had no teeth. Why did they have no teeth, the residents of, of this poor neighborhood? It's because they didn't have dental care. So they weren't able to take care of themselves because they couldn't even eat properly. And if you're not able to eat properly, then your health starts to go. Because all because of the fact that they weren't able to have proper dental care. So if you can imagine walking through a neighborhood that has five cars versus per household or three cars per household, and then walking into a neighborhood where people had no furniture and their households were plagued with bed bugs and the fact that their windows had not been washed for seven years and, and so on and so on and so on. How do you make that connection with them in 20 seconds or so? It's not easy. But you have to find a way. And I find that the best way to do it is really by speaking from the heart. Because if you can't, if you speak from the heart, I don't think you can really go wrong. Keep it short, but definitely speak from the heart. Find a way to engage with the residents. If you're running in, in city politics, I think it's really important to know your neighborhoods. Because people identify with their neighborhoods more than they identify with their subway stations. No one says, I, I, I live along the young uh, subway line, right? They'll say, I live in this particular neighborhood, or I'm from this neighborhood. This is my community center. This is my school. That's how people connect in, in, in uh, city politics. So then you need to determine, what are the issues that your neighbors care about? And by speaking in the, in, in the language of neighbors, right? Hi, I'm Kristen Longtan. I'm a neighbor in the, in the area. I'm running for, for city council. Oh, you're a neighbor. Where do you live? Oh, you're a neighbor. What do you do? Hi, I'm Kristen Wong-Tan. I own a business in this area. Oh, which business do you own? So you have to have a connection. I think that's really, really important. You could be Joe Blow. I attend this particular school. I used to, I used to you know, go to that community center. And as a matter of fact, your kid was, uh, was part of my day camp. All of a sudden, there's a connection, right? Because now they know you. Or you, or, or you share with them the fact that you, you go to the same synagogue. So there is that additional connection. So those are very important things to, to keep, in mind, uh, keep in mind. And, and knowing how you are going to continue to evolve um, in your role as a candidate, there's a very good chance that you'll begin your candidacy with some particular mindsets. And then somewhere along the way, it will probably change. Now, I've been elected now as a councillor for 20 months, and I can tell you that my first 12 months since my election uh, was a disaster in, in my mind because I miss my friends, and I had have, I have lots of friends. All of a sudden, I saw no, nothing but City Hall, and Councillor Carol can probably attest to that because she and I are office mates, so my office is right next to her office. Um, but really, it was, it was such a challenge for me because all of a sudden, everything I knew was upside down. So for the, first, for the first year, it was really, really challenging. It's a huge system. It's a huge corporation. So you're going to have to learn how the bureaucracy works. right? It is definitely possible because you know, 20 months later, I now feel very confident about how all the different bureaucracy and the departments work, how they're supposed to intersect, how they're supposed to deliver the service to, to residents, to you and your families. 
but there was going to be, like any other thing that you do, when you finish high school and you go into university for the very first time, you're probably stepping into culture shock. You may have had a high school, you may attend a high school where you had about, you know, a thousand kids in your school. You walk into the first day of campus and you realize there's like 10,000 people there. Can you imagine how jarring that is? So then I went from my office to City Hall and boom, all of a sudden I was, I was faced with whole new realities, constantly meeting new people. Everyone's been giving me their business card and I was like, okay, thank you very much. I take the business card, thank you very much, thank you very much. And then everybody, you have to sort of get to know them all. But once we got over that, now I'm having the time of my life. I'll tell you some of the things that are really, really rewarding about being a city councillor, which I really hope that you'll take this journey for. So I've got six parks in Ward 27 under redesign, and, uh, and a lot of it is going to involve children's playground, brand new equipment, uh, artist gardens, uh, architecture pavilions, and that is all exciting, because now we're getting to build stuff. We're getting to sort of, we're having an opportunity to transform and, pe and improve people's lives. So that's really, really exciting. I'm also a bit of an urban geek, so I like to talk about roads and sidewalk conditions and pedestrianization and complete streets and complete neighborhoods. And all of a sudden, I get to move projects forward that may not have a pri that may not have been a priority at the city. So now I've got about seven streets under redesign or some tor some sort of revitalization effort. So I, I represent 13 di distinct neighborhoods, but I also represent five business improvement areas. So that's a lot, if you can imagine. That's, it's a busy, busy place for 27. And, but I get a front seat at, in, in a place where I get to work with really smart and talented people who all want to do the same thing. And that's, that is they want to improve their city. They want to improve their neighborhoods. And, if there's ever anything that you'd like to change about your neighborhood, whether it's rebuilding a community center, which is something I have my eyes on. I've got one recreation center in Ward 27 serving about 100,000 people. I'd like to rebuild it. I have spaces that are dangerous, that people have been beaten in, that there has been sexual assaults, and I've done safety audits and now we're looking at changing the lighting program because we want to make sure that it's illuminated, that it becomes a, a public space that's safe for children because we know that if there's more eyes on the street, it becomes that much safer. But to be able to write a essay about it, you know, change, city change, improving a neighborhood, renovating a playground, and actually doing it is very, very rewarding. So if you can think of one thing right now, and I'll, I'll give you one thing. If you can think of one thing right now that you want more than anything else to do for your neighborhood and your community, just hold on to that. Just think about what would you like to do if you had one opportunity to change one thing. Now ask yourself, can you do it from the outside? Can you make that big transformational permanent change on the other side of the fence. And if you can, that's good. And if you can't, and you have the desire, the passion, the drive, and you want to do it on the other side of the fence as an elected official, then you hold on to that. Because sometimes when it's tough, and it can be tough, I think about those things. What is it that I want to change about my neighborhood? and then I continue to keep going. Because it gives me strength, knowing that I'm not there by myself. It gives me a lot of time to think that there's 44 great people to work with at City Council, <coughs> and we have one mayor. But my voice is just as important as your voice. My voice is supposed to represent 13 distinct neighborhoods, five BIAs, 100,000 people, not to mention an entire workforce that comes into War 27 to work. And if you've ever been to the Eaton Center, yeah, I see some smiles. Yeah, it's okay, you can admit it. If you've ever been to the Eaton Center, you've been to Ward 27. And if you've actually been down to Young Street recently for Celebrate Young, our big program, our big festival right now, that's our project. 
And if you've actually been down to Allen Gardens, which is the second oldest park in Toronto, and it has a very beautiful palm house, it's a historic greenhouse, Oscar Wilde, the great author, once lectured there. If you've ever been to Ward 27 right now, if you go to Allen Gardens, we have a public, the Canada's largest public art mural unfolding right now. 5,600 square feet of public art, 711 feet long, larger than most people's apartments and homes. The artists that contributed to this construction of this public art mural were 20, number 21, including mostly Aboriginal artists. And now this mural tells a story about the Aboriginal community and the history of, 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 their, of their people in Canada. It also was an exercise where we were able to bring in artists who didn't know they were artists. They were homeless people living in our shelters. And we gave them some money and said, come and help us paint this mural. And so out of the 21 artists, there were a handful of them that were also homeless people. And they were feeling depression. They didn't feel like they had a sense of purpose. And they found themselves working themselves out of depression by coming out and painting with other people. That was the power of transformation. And that was just one particular project. And I know that it's made a difference in people's lives. Because we also have neighbors that have come out to provide food and beverages to the artists. And remember, these guys were not artists, per se. And what they've been able to do is make a huge difference in their lives by small little gestures. Whether it's a big street transformation or a small little project, it's all very important. And every single one of them accumulate one after another to make a big impact. So I'm really thrilled that you, enjoyed it and you, uh, you invited me here to speak today. And, uh, and I really am hoping that we have a, an opportunity to continue the dialogue. If there's anything that you ever need from myself or my, or my office, you can always give us a call. I will take your call. You can come into the office. I'll be happy to give you a tour of City Hall. I know you know the chambers very well. But maybe there's other places you'd like to visit. Um, and, uh, and that is an open invitation uh, for you and your friends and your family. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions, uh, any quick questions for Councillor Montana?